I am pleased to introduce to you Colonel Tom Wilhelm, who is the Director of the Foreign Military Studies Office at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Colonel Wilhelm served 27 years as a Ar U.S. Army Infantry Aviation and Foreign Area Officer with U U.S. Military and Arms Control Units, with Russian, United Nations, NATO, and other foreign and coalition militaries, and with U.S. Embassies and Strategic Educational Institutions. His final active duty assignment was as the Associate Dean for Eurasian Studies at the George C. Marshall European Center for Euro Security Studies. He's an illustrious alumnus of Crease and the United States Military Academy. His working languages are Russian and Tajik with a sprinkling of Mongolian. Please help me welcome Colonel. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let's put illustrious into context. Uh, I can, I will start off you know, with, with my bona fides by, by uh, you know, re recounting, uh, you know, how I got into this business that, that you all are experts in. And if it was, uh, as my friends like to recall whenever we get together, uh, I'm the poster child for the very first day of learning anything about area studies and, and Russian studies with my uh, attendance at the Defense Language Institute. And on day one, going, What's that? And pointing at the board and having all my other fellow classmates who were a little sharper than me go, what are you pointing at? I said, that. And they go, oh, you mean the Cyrillic alphabet? And I said, yes. And they said, well, that's what you're going to be living with for the rest of your life. So I, that's where I started, um, just to, again, put things into context. Uh, on the occasion, though, of the 50th anniversary of the University of Kansas uh, Center for East Russian, East European, Eurasian Studies, uh, I'm reflecting on the subject of area studies in the military, and even in the, the last lecture that we got, uh, you know, we already could see that we were starting to talk about, you know, that subject then. Excuse me one second, because I put my watch here, and you all will thank me later that I did this. Um, the, you know, it's a broad subject. I mean, it's a really broad subject. Again, we saw that in the, in the, with the first discussion. But what I'm really describing, when I say area studies, when I say military, um, for area studies, I'm going to refer to it, I'm thinking of it as a kind of professional academic calling, a calling, a real social human calling. And to me, when I say military, okay, I think of it as a vital public service. It's a public service sector. So those are the concepts, you know, that uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be talking about, I think. And there are certainly social and cultural differences uh, between area uh, study students and practitioners who serve in academe or academia, universities, you know, all those great synonyms, uh, and those who serve in uniform. Uh, you know, I recognize that. But the career practice of each is equally passionate. So I think that's the basis uh, by which there's a, uh, a reconciliation between any of those social cultural differences. In American society, not only does each of these services stand to advance and prosper uh, when they work together, but in fact, there's an obligation, a social obligation, to interact and collaborate. It is inherent in the profession of arms, I can tell you after having been a military officer all my life, to study uh, the environment in which military operations occur or may occur. Area studies is integral to that. It's not all of that but it is absolutely an integral part of that. The operational environment does not merely refer to those geospatial places, I'm glad to be earlier, by the way, uh, that could be viewed as deployment locations. Operational environment is also the realm of understanding allies. It's the realm of understanding partners. It is a place that's defined by factors of economies, environment, information, and technologies. It is a place, area studies is, a, is located where many non-military social and cultural issues come together. Knowledge of all these areas, I do put that in quotes, uh, is as critical to war fighting as it is to coordinating humanitarian aid, uh, other you know, operations uh, of, the, of the type that the military is currently involved in. You know, I, I've got two quick war stories uh, that, that I, I, I highlight to to emphasize that, that involved Crease. In 1992, one of my first assignments after completing this program, there was one follow-on for the military, was to lead a team uh, to provide humanitarian aid in 
Tajikistan during the Civil War. Now, 1992 is interesting because this is this precedes this current era where we have coin doctrine uh, and the subject of military and operations other than war and its alternative uh, functions uh, were not much in um, in discussion. And there was no, there were no doctrines, there were no briefings and, and all of the things we sort of take for granted now having, you know, reading our headlines every day. Uh, but that was my assignment. And my team consisted of me, an Air Force sergeant, and two CARE International uh, uh, experts, workers. Uh, and there we were, thrown in Tajik Tajikistan. So for me, my reach back, you know, the only reach back available, but it turned out to be the best one, was back to everybody that had taught me increase, okay, and, and part of that increase experience, which included uh, like at working with the Soviet Army Studies Office at that time, or just now, I think, brand new Foreign Military Studies Office at Fort Leavenworth. We're all interconnected in the program back then. So that became my, my operational reach back, okay? And I think we, we, were, we were pretty successful. But we were not only successful in doing our mission for Tajiks and Tajikistan on that, but well, it was a successful mission and that taught me how to work with non-military types. It, it, was, it was my early baptism and all these non-war fighting functions uh, that the military would, would, would serve. My second story was not very many years later um, with, when I was selected to start the tactical relationship with the Russians uh, in their, as a member of their Russian brigade uh, in Bosnia. Uh, and that's important because the people that had established the architecture for the strategic involvement, strategic to the operational level, was, uh, was Dr. Kip uh, as one of those architects and, and other uh, people. And you know, this, this is part of the collaboration of Crease you know, that, that I found myself in, you know, driving around in a BTR-80 you know, with, with a Russian crew. Uh, you, know, it, you wouldn't think that that would be the, the first job for a Crease graduate, but, it, you know, it, but in fact, it, it was, and uh, Crease was there. <laughs> Later on, as we established uh, and continued that liaison with the Russians in the field, the Russian forces in the field, uh, many Crease graduates, as they matriculated through the Foreign Area Officer Training Program, uh, were immediately uh, part of that, and that, that program finally concluded in 2003. Uh, so it's, it's a great body of Crease uh, graduates have been involved in that uh, relationship, and I would posit to you that that probably was the high water mark of Russian and U.S. military uh, relations, maybe in the, in the since World War II, sir. Um, you know, so such university programs that look deeply uh, with experienced professionals, such as Crease, uh, where there's no immediate military practicality, help serve that, that same uh, uh, sense of professionalism. Today in America, professional military education programs such as the command and staff colleges, the defense universities, included an increasing amount of area studies in their curriculum. Recently, for instance, the Army's instituted a language and cultural strategy uh, that aims to systematically provide uh, this particular kind of education over the service and the breadth of an officer's career. So not only now will select officers go for a concentrated time, uh, all officers uh, will, will, will progressively get more and more area studies as, as inherent to their career as being an officer. An Army, the Army, this is the Army program. Uh, area studies is part of military planning and deployment preparations. Uh, I can't tell you the number of contact hours I and people in my organization have spent uh, in the last 10 years uh, talking to, to uh, units and soldiers and staffs uh, as they prepare to deploy to any one of a number of areas, not just Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, that come directly from the uh, Foreign Military Studies Office, often involving uh, other professors from the University of Kansas increased program. Uh, human terrain teams, and I think Jake's going to talk about this more, that pair social scientists with military teams and an increase in the number of foreign area officers, uh, who you've heard about several times in this lecture, uh, help address the growing need for area studies and expertise and experience at more levels in command, in policy, in defense policy formulation, and in military circles. Department of Defense regional centers such as the Marshall Center, and we'll be hearing from uh, the dean of the Marshall Center, uh, right after this, have flourished because of the realized need for the military and civilian regional practitioners to sit down together in an educational environment and discover the details of mutual security interests. As far as the military is concerned, area studies is a booming business. In any area studies program, the realm of the military is also inherent in the curriculum. 
It's not possible to have a program such as CREASE without course content that focuses on the histories, the relevant histories of war and conflict. Uh, additionally, the understanding of defense and security issues is an essential part of any country, region, or area's sociocultural dynamic. It is often the driving dynamic, and it can redefine the historic and contemporary map. Having members of the military and university classrooms, and we've got some here right now, uh, provides a military practitioner's perspective to all of this for everyone, as well as enhancing content with first-hand operations. I mean, if you don't believe that, ask any military officer to tell a war story, you know, and he will not refuse. Um, okay. Crease has understood this perhaps better than any other university and longer than any other university. And that's why last night we heard the chancellor uh, talk about uh, the preeminent status of the University of Kansas CREASE program in particular with, with forming uh, U.S. Army foreign area officers, Eurasian foreign area officers. Uh, CREASE has been doing it longer, uh, been doing it more, and it's because of that essential understanding. At the heart of this is an obligation for interaction and collaboration between area studies academics and the military. Each can learn from the other, and each can influence the other. The compelling reality is that, service, that the service of academics and military professionals intersect and each offers the other a unique and powerful, powerful laboratory for their theories and their works. Just as area studies aren't limited to geospatial and geocultural confines, uh, military missions take place in a new security territory, okay? For both the university area studies program and the military, a valid understanding of any given country or region would necessarily, necessarily include a discovery of knowledge about common and divergent, yes, history, customs, all those things we said sort of define the traditional uh, components of various studies. Uh, but also, it would be about learning about uh, defense establishments and bureaucracies, the internal and external security dynamics of a country or a region, the soft power impact of NGOs, reactions to environment, implementation of new technologies, economic and resource issues. And there's a long, how oh, many endless list of factors that define and redefine areas, new security territories, uh, in which the military and area studies programs must be uh, involved in understanding. While teaching at the Marshall Center, uh, I once had a Turkmen senior military officer who was amazed when I outlined the 15 different security organizations his country belonged to. And he said, and I quote, that's a lot for a neutral country. And he went on further and said, and said I don't think most of my contemporaries realize this, considering how high he was in his government. You know, uh, that, that was a very profound statement. Uh, programs like CREASE have always maintained uh, this sort of, you know, flexible, uh, large understanding and approach. We had the debate at the end of the last lecture on that. You, know, you focus singly or you go, you go broad. And I was mentioning during the break, I don't know that I'm the first one, but I remember uh, when I came here, I wanted to take a class in Soviet business because it was the end of Perestroika and Glasnost. There was all this, a lot of action about uh, uh, having a joint, and a joint, uh, uh, yeah, enterprises, establishing joint enterprises and stuff. And I thought that was an interesting subject, but there were no, no courses. Uh, I remember all my other contemporary friends who went to different universities, especially the ones that, you know, I remember you know, the, the thought they knew everything went to Harriman Institute, Columbia. And they, uh, at the end of it all, I was allowed to go over to the business school and strike a deal with the professors there, create programs or take the existing programs under the supervision of the, of the Reese faculty in those days. Uh, and, and work on projects then. It's, it's, that, it's that entrepreneurship, that flexible enterprise that uh, Professor Heron mentioned in the, in the very first lecture, that in fact defines the CREASE program and why it's so valuable to that relationship between military and, and area studies academics. The collaboration between militaries and academics in the field of area studies also opportunity, uh, offers the opportunity for one to influence the other. Academics and military professionals are not separate in our society. They both function to build our community and progress our society. When I was applying to come to the CREASE program as a young Army officer, the, uh, I was instructed by our Human Resources Administrator to do two things. The first was to do well in my classes and represent the Army by good professional performance. Now, that's fairly standard guidance and that's what you'd expect to be given. The second imperative I was told was to develop opportunities for students and professors to get to know the military. That's not something I had directly considered. That personal personnel administrator uh, was right, though. There were actually few opportunities overall for a career military professional to interact 
in such an exclusive public domain as when you're set in here as a graduate student. And that uh, became one of my preeminent goals as a gra in my graduate education to make that connection. And I've already given you a couple examples where immediately in my career that paid off for me in the field. Uh, two places I had not even considered being as a, as a, as a you know, you know, Russian East European studies, you know, you know, doing humanitarian aid in Tajikistan and, and then working inside a Russian brigade in Bosnia. Uh, unimaginable, improbable, as the professor did yours. Uh, but, but there it was, and this was, the, this was the reach back for me. And it did result in career-long contacts with Kreeth's faculty, like Dr. Des, Aless Dinas, uh, Masha Kip, Maria Carlson. And it gave me working relationships with my fellow Kreeth's graduates, you know, like Glenn Howard, president of the, of the Jamestown Foundation, uh, and mentorship from no less than legends in the business, like Dr. Jake Kipp, and as you'll hear later on, uh, General, you know, Dr. Uh, John Reppert. I retired several years ago, but the officer that I ultimately became was equally owed to those who with, I served in the field, and many of you sitting here today. Today I'm the director of FIMSO, following in Jake Kipp's shoes, and I firmly believe that it is part of my duties, part of my duties, to ensure that my organization works closely with Crease. In the past year alone, we've been fortunate to employ, employ two full-time former priest graduates and help others get employment. Uh, we participate in all manner of student-professor intercourse from brown bags to formal seminars, and we have in initiated an internship program, which you've heard a little bit about uh, yesterday and today. The shared passion of benefit, uh, it benefits the larger university as well as academia overall, and as well as the individual military members uh, and the U.S. defense establishment overall. So with that, I conclude my comments.